Welcome to the Lance Wall Now Show. Lance is broadcasting from one of his most recent events. You are going to be blessed and blown away by this teaching. Take it away, Lance. According to Josephus and historians, what made Cyrus make the decree, Jewish people, go back to Israel now, go back to Jerusalem, go repopulate it, build your city, build your temple, build the great house of God and pray for me and my family. What made him do that? It's believed that Daniel took to him the Isaiah scroll and showed him how 120 years before he was born, he was prophesied into existence and that God described exactly how he would come to power. And you will walk through the two lead gates of Babylon 120 years before Babylon was even a significant nation. And you will cross over on dry ground. Very interesting because Babylon is surrounded by the river Euphrates. There is no dry ground. That's what made them feel impregnable. They had walls so thick they had chariot races on top, and they had a river that surrounded them. No, that's why they were partying with goblets and doing their crazy stuff when Cyrus was breaking in. But Cyrus read that, walked over on dry ground. What Cyrus did was he diverted the river Euphrates upstream so that the river would be flowing in another direction, and he bribed the gatekeepers so that he could cross over under the gate on dry ground and enter the city of Babylon and take it overnight. And that's exactly how his strategy worked. He took it walking through the river of Babylon on dry ground. He sees the strategy. He sees the gates. He sees his name. He calls Daniel, and he says, I'm releasing your people to go rebuild the house of God. You guys got it together. Pray for me. That was what happened. So off they go. Now when the call goes for everybody to go back, only 40,000 went back out of the whole nation to rebuild the house of God, to rebuild the mighty move of the body of Messiah. Now what I'm saying to you is the prophets prophesy the political leaders come in place, and then only a remnant actually pick up on what God was giving. And so I see the pattern for us. I see the prophets prophesying. I see Cyrus Trump coming into his, his office. I see only a remnant of the church actually realizing you've been given a break. You better move fast. Most of them just sat back, crossed their arms, and critiqued the guy's tweets. And then went about our business prospering and building our ministries. We didn't, we didn't move in with urgency to build a house that could contend with hell over the nation. We didn't come together in the requisite unity that we needed to. A meeting like this is important because it's the unifying of various streams coming together for the purpose of building a house of God in this territory and in the territory you go back to. 40,000 did the house project. And so what did God do? He sends an 80-year-old prophet, an old prophet named Haggai. He sends a young prophet, about 19 to 20 years old, named Zechariah. And the tag team, old and young, prophesy. And what does Haggai say? He says, uh, God is allowing these things to happen that are happening now because he wants you to get busy on his building project. And what happened? They got shut down with a plague that impacted their economy. They got shut down with a plague that impacted all the agriculture and cut off the economic development of their 40,000 homes there in Jerusalem. They weren't building God's house. They were building their own houses. So the plague arrests it. The economy is busted and then the prophet comes and says, how's it working out? Can you guys see a pattern here? I mean, how much pain do we have to go through and faith our way through? The question you shouldn't be asking now is, well, when's Trump coming back? That's not what God's talking about. God's saying, when's my house coming back? So, the old prophet says, consider your ways. And what's interesting is, this group here, the 40,000, is called the remnant. See, I, I believe people like you are the remnant. People that I meet with Andrew uh, Womack are remnant. A remnant are the people that actually have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying. 
and are willing to go do what the Father's asking them to do. How many of you sense that there's a remnant? There's always a remnant in Israel. There's a remnant that went in this direction. The rest stayed back. But here's what I want you to see. It's so important you see this. The remnant, the Bible says, hear the word, and they start to see the pattern, the prophets, the political intervention, the project, and then the shaking because they weren't doing what God called them to do. And so the Bible says, they repented of that, and all the remnant obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. This is chapter 1. It's only two chapters. Hey, guys, a very short prophet. It says here, obey the voice. They obey the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet. And, uh, the, and, and as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people showed reverence for the Lord. Then Haggai the messenger of the Lord spoke by the commission of the Lord of the people. And God said, all right, my anointing is with you. I'm on top of you right now. I'm in the midst of you, declares the Lord. And he stirs up the spirit of Zerubbabel, and he stirs up the spirit of, uh, of Joshua, the son of the high priest, and he stirs up the spirit of all the remnant. That word for stir, curiously enough, is the word for awakening. The awakening we're looking for has already begun, and it's in you. It's in the remnant who are already sensing and hearing and adjusting yourself to what the Father's doing. And in that remnant, it's like they began then to go, to go about the work of giving God the house he wanted, and God said, I am about to shake. So the shaking they were under then was a type of the shaking that would come in the future. I believe we're in the shaking. If you've ever heard anybody preach about shaking, shaking heaven and earth, shaking, it came from this prophet who just wrote two chapters. That's his language. And so what he says is this, the prophet comes out, work for I am with you, declares the Lord. And as for the promise which I made when you came out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding in your midst, so do not fear, for thus says the Lord God of hosts, once more in a little while, uh, once more, this hasn't even happened yet, We're talking about the last days now, once more in a little while I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land, I'm going to shake all the nations, and they will come with the wealth of the nations, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, and the latter glory of this house will be greater than the former. For in this place I am going to give supernatural shalom and peace, says the Lord. So evidently there's going to be great shaking, including economies. And God says, but in this place where this is working, there'll be provision. You're, you're building a boat to float. You're like Noah creating your own ark when you get involved with God's building project. Your region's different. Your city is different. I'm preaching better than you're amening right now. <laughs> the latter glory of the house. The latter glory of the house. I'm looking at the book of Acts as a standard for the glory of the former house. And God says, when I pour out my spirit in all flesh, the latter glory shall even eclipse that which you see in the book of Acts. <laughs> That's the house God wants to build. Then the Lord says, speak to Zerubbabel, the governor. This is interesting. Not all of you are preachers, but you see the word of the Lord is constantly going to Zerubbabel, the governor. What does that mean? There's a secular office in this move of God. The marketplace, the businessman, the teacher, the daycare worker, the person who's not the priest in the pulpit with the microphone. There is a Joshua there. There is a high priest. He has a whole prophecy given to him. But the word of the Lord in Haggai is to Zerubbabel. This is the person who's not the high priest, temple teacher. This is the person who's actually in the building process for the nation. He says, you tell him, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, and I'm going to overthrow thrones. Oh, this is an interesting word. Thrones and kingdoms. Well, now we find out. Why is God shaking heaven and earth? Because down here you got political systems. Up there you got the principalities ruling them. God says, I'm going to shake up the thrones in the spirit that are over the natural governments of the earth. I'm going to shake the thrones of the spirit, says the Lord of hosts, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of hosts, eight times in two chapters. The word host means angelic armies. The God of angelic armies is laying siege to thrones in the second heavens to overturn them in order to bring about the governments he wants for sheep nations on the earth. Yeah. 
This revelation, man, has got to get into it. Then God says this. He says, Zerubbabel, I'm going to give to you a special anointing. It's a signet ring. This is a weird word, except that it shows up in the book of Esther. It says this. He says, uh, I'm going to destroy the thrones of kingdoms. I'm going to overthrow nations. I'm going to take you, verse 23, chapter 2, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, my servant, and I'm going to make you like a signet ring, for I've chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. Like a signet ring. What is a signet ring? You're going to see this story show up again. A signet ring in the days of uh, monarchs was, uh, was the ring that would bear the imprint of the house, the house of Judah, uh, the house of uh, Cyrus. The signet ring was shaped uh, to bear the image of the house so that when it was impressed on wax, it would imprint like a signature of the king, or you could say it was the equivalent of a credit card system, where when the wax was on the document and the ring was on the wax, when the ring pulled back, it left the impression of the ring and hardened in to a decree that all of the wealth and military power that was behind that ring was upon that document. So when a document was sealed with it, you wouldn't open it unless it was in the presence of the right people because it was sealed with a signet ring. If it had to do with a transaction with an ambassador, the signet ring went in to know that the house of Cyrus, his army, and his treasury is behind what I'm presenting right now. The signet ring is pretty powerful. Well, what would it mean to, uh, to Zerubbabel? It means that God himself has a name, and he himself has an army, and he himself has resources. And when he gives you an assignment, and you're dedicated to that assignment, you have the authorization to apply the name of Jesus to see everything shift that has to change. You have the authority of the name to imprint itself. It also means that when you're in the company of people, something interesting will happen. And I'll show you how this works, and, it's, and I'll develop it uh, when I speak again a day after tomorrow. The favor of God... The scepter of access and the signet ring all go together. The favor of God is upon you for the assignment that God gave you. The signet ring is that when you're doing the thing God called you to do, you can decree and prophesy, speak to the wind, you can speak in prayer, you can authorize in the spirit realm what has to take place. And then when you prevailed in that area, you can go into the company or presence of the people on earth who have to make that decision and when you speak, the power of what you say imprints on them something that they cannot escape from when you leave their presence. You have pressed the very message God gave you into their heart, and it has its desired effect. For when you leave, God has put his word into the soft, malleable uh, uh, context of their heart. He's made an imprint. They may be mad at you. They may be glad. But they will not forget, nor can they resist the authority of the signet ring. Does that make sense to you? So the question is, the, uh, the favor of God gives you access. The signet ring is the, is the authorization. What is the scepter? The scepter is what we're going to find out in the story of Esther. It's the central character. Because the scepter of Esther is you have to have access to that throne wherein the signet is given to you. And this is kind of a mystery to me. And I don't want to be superficial with this. We're in a period now where there's a great realignment happening in the house of God. Because not everybody is responding to God's priorities the same way. And so there are people that are aligning like the house of Saul and aligning with the house of David. And some are, some are overcome with the affairs of this life. And others are pressing in with a renewed earnesty to hear what the Father is saying and align. So there, it's as though the Lord is, is in a sense, re-evaluating and positioning us in this season, for our promotion and for our place of service appointed in the house he's building. So what happened here was the House of God project, the remnant had an awakening to build the house. They went to build the house. And when the house was built, the next stage came in. Nehemiah comes along with Ezra. Remember what I said? These books are the books that came 
after the Jews returned, that refers to the 1948 return of the Jews to the United States, or to, to, to Israel, and the, uh, and the era of the uh, Gentile nations that we're in right now is the period of time that's written in a parallel with the books that took place in the Jews returning in the era of Cyrus. It's right there in our face. What happened after they built the house? They had restored the house, but they didn't have authority in the territory. You all want America to be changed. When the church becomes what God wants it to be, the nation will be changed. When the church becomes the house that can prevail with the gates of hell, hell will no longer control the politics and news of the nation. That's why the house is the project. And you want to get a hold of LanceWilmer.com forward slash Hagen. Kenneth Hagen had a prophecy that describes this moment. H-A-G-I-N. LanceWilmer.com forward slash H-A-G-I-N. Kenneth Hagen's prophecy from 1967 about tongues of fire coming down in America at a moment when Marxism and communism was rising up like a dark cloud to destroy the country. This is the moment we've been waiting for. The revival and the awakening has begun. H-A-G-I-N, LanceWalmer.com forward slash H-A-G-I-N. Nehemiah and Ezra come along, and what did they do? Once the house was built, once the temple was built, the problem was the people had their religion but their religion was under threat because there was a hostile world around them. And so Nehemiah went and said, we will restore the walls and the boundaries and rebuild the gates of influence. What are the walls? Proverbs says a city that is uh, a, city, a city without walls is like a man without self-control, destined to be plundered and broken into. America is a nation that has lost self-government. It's under the impulse of every bizarre fetish trend and exotic inclination that, uh, that carnal man can come up with. And then they advance it all the way up to the highest positions in the land and then put it in your face as the new model you must bow down to. It's a nation that's lost self-government. It's under, under, under lust and bizarre extremism in every corner. And as a result, we're being plundered and broken into. I don't have to point out the natural obvious fact, which we had 10 million people crawling over our borders because we lack the ability to even have walls in our nation because we've lost our self-government. And they're coming after that. They're coming after your ability to govern yourself. They're coming after your freedom. It's happened already with COVID. They'll redefine what your freedoms are. You've lost the ability for self-government, and therefore another government will have a tyranny over your life if you don't restore it. Nehemiah comes along once the house is built. Once the spiritual vitality of the church reaches a certain threshold of cap capacity, then the walls around the nation get built again. The boundaries start to come back on marriage, on family. The boundaries start to come back on economic irresponsibility. The boundaries start to come back on freedom versus having to bow the knee to government. And the gates, what are the gates? The gates are the gates of influence. For years, I talked about the seven mountains. They are the gates of influence. Suddenly, there's media, and we have media now. Thank God. We can speak here. We aren't done yet. That's We have this platform. There's going to be more voices coming out on different media. Trump's starting his own competing media right now. We're going to see competing systems are going to show up. If the, if the government isn't going to respond, there's going to be a populist movement that will produce a populist backlash. It will be fed by the Great Awakening is happening spiritually, but it is going to be with many secular people who don't really understand the spiritual war, but their hearts are in alignment with the recovering of their own nation. And if you're one of those people that just goes, well, I don't want to get involved with it. The Lord's going to come back. I'm just going to pray. You're a fool. You must go to the assignment God's given you. Build the house and restore the walls and the gates. We're in the combination right now of both of these at one time. We're trying to recover boundaries. Do it at a state level if you can't do it at a national level. Do it at a local level if you can't do it at a state level. Use the authority God gave you where you are. There's devils to fight in all locations. Walls and gates. Once Nehemiah came, they not only had a house of God, they had walls and gates. And when they had walls and gates restored, then right after that, it was Jesus who came into the city through that gate and manifested himself. 
That's the coming of the Lord. It's the second coming. It's the return of Jesus. Call it the rapture of the church. It's when God pours his spirit out on all flesh in such a way that you're going to see Christ manifest and there'll be a consummation of history. But it's not going to happen until Jesus has nations for his inheritance. It's the promise of Psalm 2. I don't know why it is that we're all, everybody talks about souls. I used to get upset with Bob Jones. He talked about the billion soul harvest, the billion soul harvest. I said, don't you know in Psalm 2, Jesus was promised nations. When you've got nations, you've got harvest. Why is it we can only think in terms, think in terms of souls and not nations? It's the same as saying that Jesus doesn't have any country in the world. After Islam comes along 500 years after the resurrection, they've got seven nations under Sharia law. They've got seven nations, and Jesus doesn't have one? It's not going to be that way. If nothing else, I'll find an island somewhere, and it'll be a Jesus nation. <laughs> the prophets prophesy. God gives secular rulers. Secular rulers come along. They tell... They create an opportunity for God's people to recover the spiritual vitality of a spiritual house that can go up against the gates of hell. So they can restore the walls and, and occupy the gates so that the nation can be a sheep nation. And when these nations are formed, the Lord will be bringing up the consummation of history. This gospel of the kingdom is preached in all the world as a witness. I believe where the kingdom goes, it's more than just salvation. It's the kingdom modeled in a nation. It's to some degree... The government will not molest, persecute, malign, and harass God's people. Amen. That's Hungary. That's Poland. That's Brazil. That so far has been the United States. There are other countries in the world, but they're kind of in the valley of decision. They're making decisions right now. And this is where the house of God is a global building project. Does this make sense to you? Yeah. Now, the unusual story here with a blue pen is if you go back to the book of Esther, Esther is the chapter, fascinatingly enough, where does this uh, house is coming along, building projects coming along, but something's happening right in here. It's called the book of Esther. Now, here's, here's a wild story. This is also part of the pattern. We just came through the Feast of Purim a week ago. I'm not always tracking with the Hebrew feast, although I'm 20% Ashkenazi Jew, and I've got a sister as an Israeli citizen. I probably should do better at this. But I never felt that you had to have a special uh, Israel revelation in order to enjoy the full benefits of Christianity. But I'm telling you something. You ought to go back and study the feasts of Israel because what I found out is those feasts actually are eternal feasts. And I realized something, that if they're eternal and all Gentiles are engrafted into Abraham, therefore you are the spiritual seed of Abraham and therefore you're the spiritual Jews that are in the earth. You ought to take a look at those feasts. So we just came through the Feast of Purim, and I was reading it again, and I got this amazing insight. The Feast of Purim is 40,000 Jews went down and built the house God called them to build. But all the other Jews, about 90%, stayed in Babylon because it was nicer there. They didn't make the trek. They stayed up there under Cyrus. Why not? Cyrus is a great king, removed all terrorism, prospered the economy. Why go to that God-forsaken land where they're beating up on Jews and do a building project? I'll send them a check. <laughs> so they stayed up there. And an antichrist persecution arose against them in the government. A man named Haman suddenly appears out of nowhere. He comes into power and influence over the government overnight. And his agenda is specifically targeting the religious liberties of the people of God. Because they won't get vaccinated, take the passport, and wear the mask the way he wants them to. <laughs> However you want to put it. He's at the gate, and everyone bowed down in submission to him except for Mordecai the Jew who said, no, nah, that's against my personal beliefs. And he got mad at that one who wouldn't submit to his power. So he went back to the king. And he said, uh, there's a people in your land that really are a problem. I don't think we're ever going to be able to have unity in our government as long as they're rebelling against you. So uh, with your authority, I'd, I'd like to go ahead and deal with this. The king 
takes the signet ring off of his hand and gives it to Haman. Now Haman authorizes a date for a test of national unity, kind of like Trudeau taking on the truckers. He's going to take away their bank accounts, their houses, their jobs, and potentially lock them up if they don't bow the knee to his government. Basically, that was Haman's deal. Every Jew in the country would have all of his assets, his house, and his property taken. And, of course, they'd have to be killed so that people could go in and occupy all that real estate. Terrible plan. Mordecai gets wind of it, and he notifies Esther. Esther is married to the king. Esther is what we would call a covert Christian. She's a, a Jew, but nobody knows it. She's kept it secret. And the Bible doesn't falter for that. She was actually listening to what Mordecai told her. He said, listen, you know, just, just take it from me. Just don't, don't reveal your, uh, your origins. Let's let God do what he's doing. Well, he comes back to her and says, you're going to have to tell him. You're going to have to go plead for the sake of your people so that they're not destroyed. And she says, well, understand something. The protocol in the Persian court is that I'm just one of many people that gets his attention. And if he doesn't invite me to the throne and I show up unannounced, depending on his mood, I could be dead. And he's uh, a man given to um, unpredictable temperament. You ever see the movie 300 with Lion Eyes and the Spartan? This is Sparta. Boom. The Persian king that he was up against, the guy looks like kind of like a giant, like, you know, Tony Robbins cartoon character or something. That guy is Cyrus, is, is, uh, is, is Xerxes. That's the man Esther's married to. That was her husband. He's known in history as being a, uh, a ruthless and unpredictable ruler. He had one of his best friends send him a million dollars worth of a gift for his birthday. And he said, I'm just so moved by your generosity. He sent it back and like doubled it. Said, thank you for your, for your allegiance and your service as a general. The general came back and said, your next campaign is coming up. I've got one son at home. I'm aging. If, if I please you, would you allow him to stay home with me to take care of me in my old age? And for some reason, Xerxes went crazy. He ordered the son to be executed and cut in half so that his army would march through the torso on the left side and on the right side and know that no one, not even his friends in the military or in government, is exempt from military duty when the nation goes to war. That's a pretty extreme guy. And this is the guy you're going to go interrupt in the office and violate the protocol of access because he's not calling for Esther. Esther's calling on him. So she says, fast and pray three days because if he doesn't extend the scepter to me, I'm dead. That's why that story's in there. So they fast and pray three days and she goes and the king invites her into his presence. Now here's the amazing thing. With the favor of God on her, the favor of access, the favor that was there to get access, she has the wisdom to know not to ask for deliverance because she won't, it's premature. This is real wisdom. She doesn't, she says, whatever you want, Esther, you can have it. People only come in here when they want something, and you have favor. You can have what you want. She doesn't go further than he can handle. And she says, if I have favor, then come to my house for a banquet. Would you come tomorrow night to a banquet? Sure. And I'll bring Haman with you. So Haman comes to the house for the banquet. They have a merry time, a great time. You'd think that she would right then say, uh, I have a problem. She doesn't. She said, do I have really favor with you? He goes, I love being with you. This is so good. I'm having the time of my life. I need to do I don't know why I don't do this more often. She said, then, if you love me and if I'm pleasing you, tomorrow night. One more, one more night. Come on. You deserve it. All right. Then bring Haman with you. <laughs> the next night, she makes the appeal. But think of the wisdom of this. She waited. She waited. That's the wisdom that moves with favor. And she says... I beg you, I have one request. If me and my people were to be put in slavery, I'd accept it. I wouldn't even be bringing it up to you. That happens. It happens. I understand that. 
But to have us killed, to have me, your wife, killed, I beg you, spare my people and spare me. He said, what are you, what are you talking about? Who, who in the world? Now it's like, who in the world is threatening you? She said, this wicked Haman has manipulated you into signing an edict that kills me and my people, a loyal people, a faithful people. And the king is furious because he realizes that he was manipulated. His ring's on this guy's finger, and, it is, and he had a plan. And it, this is what he was up to. He goes off into the garden angry, which is not good for Haman. <laughs> Haman, in desperation, gets up to go plead with Esther. And in an unfortunate, almost comical moment of Antichrist history, an angel puts out its foot, and he trips over the angel's foot, and he falls on top of Esther, lying on top of her, at the very moment that the king comes back in to talk about it. He goes, what? And on top of everything else, you're trying to have sex with my wife in front of me? Haman, oh, my God, Haman, oh, no, I, I tripped, I tripped. Get him out of her. They put a bag over his head, which means he'll never see the light of day again. And the, he, says, he says, kill him and uh, get that ring back. And they say, well, look, he, he has a gallows in his uh, backyard, which he was going to hang a guy Mordecai on. Uh, just hang him there. He goes, exactly, hang him on that gallows. Hung on the very gallows he created for the destruction of God's people. <laughs> what I'm giving you tonight, folks, isn't just your ordinary, typical sermon. I'm trying to tell you, laden within the leaves of the book from Cyrus and Esther and Nehemiah and Haggai, we're living that chapter right now. I can't put my finger on exactly which character you are and what role you're playing, but we're living in the cycle of what God has already put in front of us. The challenge for us is to be the remnant that shows up. Some of you are going to have to come out of the closet. You're a little too covert. And it may be that that was totally good to do in the school system and in the office before, but now the Spirit of God is going to press you because he put you in that position to be an influence for his kingdom. For others of you, like Mordecai, well, you're a Christian, but you haven't taken a stand yet. And when Haman comes through the gate, you have to obey God and stand and not kneel when the system forces you to kneel. All of us have a role to play. If you're as Zerubbabel, you're going to need to get in the presence of God. This, this is the part that I have for all of you. The scepter of Esther is access to the throne of God so that God can give you the assignment he has for you. You can go to the throne of grace anytime you want. I could preach that sermon, but there's something different I'm going to tell you. There is a certain transaction with God where God is releasing assignments. If you will get yourself in the right place, heart and mind, the right alignment, you need to go before the Father and ask him, what are you called to do? Are you a Nehemiah or an Ezra? Are you going to be the, what is your assignment? God is going to give to you the authorization to do something. When you get that assignment, you get the signet ring with it. And then you go about doing by faith what God called you to do. Does this make sense to you? If you agree with me, stand to your feet and let me just close this out. The word of the Lord is coming to you tonight. That God is looking, sifting out the hearts of men, looking through the hearts of women. And I'll tell you something. Your past has no relevance right now to what's happening. There's many people that resist the call of God because the devil brings up unfinished business, sins, and blah, 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 blah. I'm telling you right now, do not let your history have an impact on what's happening right now. Because... God has the right to assign anyone to do anything. And, it, he, and he can do it regardless of your unfinished business. So, Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for this event that you're bringing us all together at this cosmic time in order to uh, shake us into new relationships, new alignments, new assignments. I pray that even divine healing is going to be breaking out in this conference because the lives and physical bodies of your servants are going to need to be able to have the wear and tear capacity to do the work they're called to do in the next season. 
I know there's a lot of folks that are older here. Lord, we've got to rebuke the spirits of infirmity and age that would be the excuse we would normally have. For you're going to pour your spirit upon the old and upon the young. You're going to have two generations running together in America. And I'm thanking you, Lord God, that you're releasing new assignments. Even this week, the Spirit of God is going to begin to rearrange your thinking about certain things, challenge certain things, and put you in a position where you can actually run in the lane that God's assigned you, the race that he has for you. And if you agree with me, say, as one. As one. 1967, Kenneth Hagan, who had his uh, Oral Roberts and Kenneth Hagan uh, were both based in Tulsa, along with Harrison House and a multitude of other ministries. And in, and in Tulsa, Brother Hagan, who was part of that 1948 revival, as was Oral Roberts, that move of God that happened after World War II, uh, that move of God that I look at at the, at the fourth turning, we look for awakenings to put America back on track. Fourth turning is a term that we've used often. Bannon uses it. It refers to a cycle of crises in America every 80 to 100 years that redefines who we are as a nation. It's a crisis of survival. And when we come through the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, the Second World War, there typically is an awakening. And the awakening either precedes it or it closely follows it. And it establishes the direction we had that revival in 1948. 1967, Kenneth Hagin, who was part of that early move of God, he had a vision of fire coming down from heaven. And it was fire coming down because this inky black uh, hand of Marxism and communism, totalitarian takeover of America, had suddenly risen up uh, as, as almost like a demonic cloud and was descending upon the nation. But God did something to disrupt that agenda. And Hagen at first was concerned because he, he looked at the faces. He saw people were burning like they're on fire. And he was wondering, well, what does that mean? Then he looked more closely. It was tongues of fire. Mm -hmm. They were getting tongues of fire. And he saw a move of God that was going to be global. I believe that we're in that move right now. And this would be what would disrupt that agenda. But Hagen did say something that disturbed me in that prophecy in 1967. I mean, we're talking like pre-Reagan, pre-Trump, pre, you know, most of you guys, some of you guys weren't even born back then. And uh, he said that enjoy what you have in your nation because you're never going to have more freedom than you've got right now. Mm -hmm. And you're never going to have more uh, opportunity for prosperity than you've got right now. And indeed, we're watching our econ economics and we're watching our freedoms only erode and be fought for at the Supreme Court. So you, so I say every day, you know, rather than waking up and being miserable, I'm making a new uh, reorientation. I'm not focusing on what we're losing. I'm focusing on enjoying the freedom we have today. Because if Hagen's prophecy is accurate, you're never going to have more freedom than you have right now. What you want to do is protect what you've got so it doesn't be diminished. And you want to get a hold of LanceWomo.com forward slash Hagen. Kenneth Hagen had a prophecy that describes this moment. H-A-G-I-N. LanceWomo.com forward slash H-A-G-I-N. Did you enjoy this latest episode? Please remember to share it with your friends.